Okay, say that again. Uh, you use alcohol to clean like your equipment, but don't ever use acetone with like plastic equipment because it'll eat through the plastic. So you use like isopropyl or ethanol. Isopropyl is better. It's a little cheaper. It does the same thing. So this is acetone. So acetone you could use for this. Yeah, because I'm just cleaning this the metal. Surface. Like I don't care if uh, the material on it anything happens to it because I'm gonna throw it out. And the metal's not gonna be affected. Right. Just the it's just the plastics are. Yeah. It reacts with plastic. So. And it warps it? I like eats it. So one thing you want to keep in mind with the scale is that the max weight is 120 grams. So don't like just throw a big heavy sample on it. It's not going to read what you're trying to measure. And how do you zero it? So first, start with like a decently clean surface and hit tear. Once it like, once you see this V show up, that's when it's like calibrated, it's gotten its final measurement. Otherwise it'll be like bouncing back and forth, which you'll see in a second. So I'm going to grab a... Now what is this? So this is weighing paper. What paper? Like weighing paper. Oh. Uh, I'm just gonna set one of these on here. So you'll see here the measurements are jumping around. Once it like settles on a value that G will show up, like the, the measurement, the unit value. So that's when you get to hit tear. So now we can start to pour the material on top of that. So I wouldn't start with the powder first. Um, I mean, I'll just, hang on. Can I do that? I'll show you how to do the powder, like a little bit. And, uh, but we'll start with the resin. So, so I just want to see how this thing like flows. So, okay. You want to open the bag of powder and just like gently Gently pour like a little bit up on the thing paper. You're right, this is really chalky. Uh, you don't want to go fast with this because like if it spills on the side, you just lost that material. And I mean, I think your regular is free, right? Or like $20. But I think this one is a little bit more expensive. Oh, okay. Well, then yeah, you, you definitely don't want to waste material. And typically stuff is pretty expensive. So. so yeah, just little by little, start pouring it out. I usually stop if I see it going like 15 or above. Or like if it's just really piling on and forming like a mountain that's kind of like, it's in danger of spilling over on the sides. Yeah, once you have that, just want to be gentle with the bag of powder. Just kind of get that stuff back in. And uh, normally, like, you'd have the resin already in the bottle, and you'd kind of scoop this up. So you want to do that with two free hands. So just bend it on the sides and form like a crease in the back so it doesn't spill over on that side. So you can lift it. And I'm gonna pour it back in here. Thank you. But yeah, just wherever you need it to put it in, just pour it in. Okay. But never just lift it with one hand though, you will probably spill it. Okay. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, I didn't, because we're just doing this as like a training, I didn't write any of that value down, but like, let's say you had your material on here before you pick it up and put it wherever it needs to go. Write down the measurement of uh, it being displayed, like how much mass you have on the scale. And then once you finish pouring uh, your material into whatever it needs to be in, put the weight paper back on it and take another measurement. Wait until it gets to like a static value and subtract it from what you measured before. Because some residue is going to stay on that link here. Really? Yeah. Like, even if it's a small amount, it's significant when it comes to these mixes. Right. 
Yeah. It's gonna change your weight percentages, so you wanna keep track of that. So, so 420? Yeah, so we lost a little bit of mass. It's like stuck on the weighing paper. Uh, right now I'm gonna swap that out with a new one, just cause I bend it a bit and there's some residue on it. You don't have to always swap it out. But you can always just continue and keep in mind that there's some residue on it. Okay. And just like, again, measure out the end, see how much there is, you know, whatever. Just don't tear it after like you put a clean sheet on it. Okay. This is the best way I found, like most uh, controllable way I found to measure the resin. Uh, first, you want to put, instead of weighing paper, you want to put just like a wipe on the scale. And you're going to use the actual cap of the resin bottle as your uh, kind of measuring device. So it's essentially the same as the powder. Basically, we'll put the cap on the scale and we have the napkin or whatever in the way just in case anything comes out from the sides, you don't want it to spill onto the scale and you like make a mess. So once it gets to static value, this cap is really lightweight, so it's a good container for this kind of stuff. Close this, it has me nervous. Okay. So I'm going to wait until that gets to good value. Now I can take this off and show the negative version of that value we just tear. I'll pour some resin into here. Unlike the powder, you don't want to pour the resin inside of this scale because you can make a pretty bad spill and that would definitely be hard to clean up. For example, here I just filled up the bottle cap. Be really careful putting this in, you don't want to spill some. You don't have to fill it up as much as I did, that's just an example. So now we know there's 27.43 whatever grams of resin in that cap. So we want to write that down. I'm just going to use my notes in my phone. <clears throat> You can use a piece of paper, or whatever you want, just keep track of these numbers. So 27.436 grams. And so the next thing we're gonna do is grab that cap. And remember this is something you should do before the powder. Just transfer it over. If you want to use a different container besides this cap, there's no rule against that. Just keep in mind the max weight of that scale is 120 grams. And this cap is pretty lightweight, so it's convenient. So just kind of take your time, make sure some of it drips down. If any of it, like try not to spill some over the side and have it like drip down the sides of the bottle cap. And if there's any kind of like this, if there's any on the sides, don't clean it up yet because we need to know how much resin was lost. So I'm gonna put this cap on again without cleaning it. That's why we have the napkin there. And now you can see 0.812 grams are still on that cap. So now I wrote that down and I can do the math to know how much is currently in that bottle. And we just want to make sure that there's roughly exactly what we need. So right now we're going for 50 grams. Uh, we want to make sure that the next time when we transfer over the resin to the bottle, there's going to be exactly 50 grams, including what was lost, just uh, didn't go in the, the bottle. And you want to start with the resin first instead of the powder because the powder is easier to control the quantity since you saw like the difference between uh, what was on the weight paper before you poured it in and what was on the weight paper after is really small. Whereas with the resin, it's a big difference. So, and also once you mix the powder into the resin, there's no going back. It's like, you know, you can't take it out. So if you over measure whatever with the resin, you can always, you know, start over. 
so now we have like our mix 50 50 powder and resin so uh, before you blend it you want to take a spatula i already cleaned this off with acetone and then just manually mix them together this is just to like remove any clumps and get the mix kind of going and once it's decently mixed uh, then you can actually attach the blender top and mix it sheer mix it Mixing it by hand isn't enough to like make it um, evenly dispersed to prints. You're gonna get a lot of issues if you print like this, but we need to do this before you blend it. Otherwise, um, the blender is not gonna get the mix. So just get some off the sides, make sure there isn't like powder pumped up anywhere. Uh, and once you're done, This is an interesting mix. It should start to not feel like there's very much resistance to mixing it. You shouldn't feel like clumps anywhere. And uh, once it's like this, where it's like kind of like a protein shake or smoothie, that's when you know it's good. Um, at least to start to blend it. Just scrape it off, try not to get any on the outside because it'll get stuck with the blender. Uh, set this aside to clean and we can put on the top. Cap is open. This cap just goes on. You want to make sure you can move this part because it'll still like vibrate and make a noise if this is jammed and you don't want to like not be sure mixing. One thing you want to do before you start to blend is put it upside down, let it drip down for a while. And just do it a couple times, like flip it over, flip it back, just get as much of it down as you can. And, uh, I don't know if you want to shoot this all in one shot, but we have to connect this to some kind of power supply. How long? Uh, it should be decently mixed. I would do this for like a couple seconds and take it off. Um, flip it back over, let it like kind of move around a bit, and then try to mix it again. Because there's some on the, along these walls that aren't going to be mixed. Okay. So it's going to be like trying to grab as much of it as you can. Gotcha. This is why it's better to have a stick right here, but uh, we'll, we'll do that later. So, uh, there you go. Uh, with certain powders, it's like not properly, like you want to make sure this is really tight. Uh, you kind of start to get a smell like coming out of this blender. Just stop. Okay. Like a burning smell? Like a burning smell or yeah. like a powder. Just, just stop. Okay. <laughs> First thing you do when you have a new material is you take one of these kind of glassware pieces and instead of using the vat film and filling up the whole thing like you would when you're printing a part, you just pour a little slurry on this, put it over where your part would print and then like let the UV light shine on it, see if it like cures any any kind of layer at all. So we're gonna do that. Here would be the printer if it was, you know, the vat film and bed attached so we just take these up the bed never lay the bed down flat like this because you might puncture the, the vat film lay it upside down it's kind of dirty right now we should clean that and then same with this don't like lay it flat on the, on the table like this and lay it upside down and actually well i'm gonna put this here for now um, I should clean it up a bit. So I'm gonna clean that before we print anything. But uh, basically, we'll go into uh, Teflon layer, which is the sl the slicer for this printer, kind of like Kira on the FTM printers. And we'll just set something like in the middle of the print, like a circle or whatever, to just shine a light on this glass and see if it hardens anything. Okay. This is Teflon layer. 
the software that we use to slice the files. Um, and once you actually open it up, it'll just be like this. You don't have to worry about the bed size or anything because this is meant for the Bison 1000. There isn't really an option to do other stuff. Um, let's say you want to import something. The extracurricular possible fun mobs. Not too sure. See here. Uh, yeah, this cube. So let's say we have the test cube in there. Like that's just a slice you got from your cut software. That's your STL file. Um, you would like up here in this tab, it's really similar to uh, Cura, but like obviously a different interface. So over here, this button you can use to rotate the uh, like part that you set in there. You can manually like roll or click this up or down, or you could just type a value and add it, subtract it. I tend to do that. Next thing, you can scale your parts. So for example, here I have it set to, I could manually type two times scale, apply. This went from five millimeters to 10 millimeters. Um, next thing, if I click this center part, it'll bring it back to the origin. If I click the button right next to it, add translation, I can same thing type or drag or whatever and move it around the bed. So for example, here I moved it to the side. I want it to be back in the center so I know exactly where I'm putting my stuff. If I click center part, it just goes back. Um, if you want to, for example, copy a part, I haven't had much luck with the mirror command. Like command. If you get that working, let me know. But for example, if I copy it, click number of copies too, it'll just create a second one, and then I can place that wherever, right? Okay, so I'll delete that. To delete a part, uh, you can click on it and then just click the delete key on the computer. Um, if, I'll put this back in the center. If uh, you want to add supports, you have to click support mode over here in the, the right side of the screen, up here in this section. Uh, I don't typically do this because they tend to break with the materials we use since they're pretty um, like fancy. But, oh, whoops, that's not good. No, that's never happened. Can't seem to close it either. Oh, there we go. Not sure what that error was. That's not supposed to happen. So this is what I mean by supports. Like your support structures and this kind of printing are a little different than FTM. You can like click on one of these columns and like manually change the settings. Or if you go into support generation, basic, advanced, you can change like how many of them you want to appear with density. You can change like the thickness of each. Uh, the angle that it will make contact with the, the part with. Um, it's an option. You can use it if you need it. I tend to use this if my part is warping in the bed, but like that's rare. You won't need to use this too much. And it, but again, because of the materials we're using, this will tend to like cause more issues than it helps. So you want to be careful with how you do this. You can also um, drag the part down onto the bed. I like that. It's kind of supports. For example, center it, generate supports. For example, if I didn't want the part to be hanging off, this is what I tend to do. Uh, if I need to add supports, I'll uh, place the part on the bed, create the supports, and then drag these columns out and like place them wherever I need to like prevent warping. But that's a rare situation, just so you know, you can do that. Uh, okay, but let me go back to support generation, clear supports. Uh, okay, so finish supporting again here in this right side of the screen. Um, should be able to exit it. Yeah, so now I'm going to show you how to slice it. So 
I'm going to center it again. We'll just keep this for your tests. Up here, you have to select whether you want 100 micron, 25, 50, whatever. So I'm going to keep it at 100 for our tests. You will decide this later once you know the thickness of your first layers. But um, when you're testing your material, I recommend you keep it at 100 because that's how, that's how high the bed is going to move after every layer. As well, once you have the part where you want, supports, whatever settings you needed, you click Start Slicing over here in the top like, right side of the, the ribbon. And then, actually, I don't have my USB connected. So, this USB is okay. So, let's say Slice Projects. Select the project folder, right? Not now. So now that I, like you just click where you want to save this, the file to, it's going to save it as a folder just full of um, like images. And I'll show you in a bit, but for example, I'll call this, oops. I'll call this test. I think that's just the name of the file, test. Uh, and it kind of gives you that option. How do you want to save it? You can click OK, start slicing when you're ready. And remember, all of the settings you're going to like printing parameters you're going to do on the printer. So this is just like creating the file that it's going to make, like the part. Um, so let's go into the projects. Uh, so here's test.slice, right? And there's a bunch of, you can see, images. And then the IDX file, which is what the printer will read. Can you see what one of them looks like? Sure. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. just like where the light's going to shine on the right. Yeah. And then this IDX, I don't, I never tried opening it. Let's see. Can I open with, yeah, let's try it. Um, see if I can read it. Yeah, see, so here's like basically your G code. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's a little different here, but then it's like telling it like at this position, shine this PNG mm -hmm. that's in the folder. Yeah. Cool. That's so, pretty awesome. Yeah, so I'm just going to delete these real quick before we put it in the printer so we don't cause any issues because this USB wasn't from the printer. This is just the stuff that comes with the USB. And so now I can eject it and put it in the printer. So you're filming? Yep, I'm okay, filming. So this was the USB I just got your file from in the computer. Let's put it in, hopefully it works all the same. That is rough, hang on. Okay. Well, let's see here, it should pop up. Test lice, okay, perfect. Fortunately, I'm gonna have to like I had a backup of what we had on that USB, but for now we can you can see like the time out. This is wrong. Usually the first time you put a file in, it's gonna give you a time that's like completely wrong. The first time you run the file, it'll actually like show you what it is. But here I'll just run the file actually. So so you can see. Uh, we can change the parameters and it's done. So it'll show you that like here I'll actually It'll show you that first black panel that like came up for a second. You have to click on it once or else it won't ever start. Uh, and you can also click on, you know, for example, just on the screen on this wait button, pause your print, preview. What it'll do is it'll bring up the bed and show you what's currently on the print bed. That's gonna affect your part quality if you do that. That's, that's an option. Like if you just want to do a quick test and then you can also cancel your prints. Usually it won't be that fast. It'll try to finish the layer it's on mm -hmm. and then cancel. Otherwise, like, you know, there might be a piece stuck on the, the VAT film, but that is an option. Just don't panic if it's like you click cancel and it didn't cancel. Okay. It's probably it's just taking a little time. You don't have to like click on anything to re remove the USB, you just take it out. Okay. Yeah. So we just ran into a little issue with that first test print, and I think it's a good 
kind of point to learn from. So for example, let's say the file I just put in, in the computer, I had set it to 100 micron. But over here, in the like printing parameters, I have my material set to 50 micron. So when I start a print, none of the printing parameters that I had set before are going to be working because it's not reading from what I just set up. It's I'll just cancel that. Perfect. So for example, now you don't have to change the whole material, but it's just I haven't set up any printing parameters at 100 micron for material four. So I'll go to material two, which was our uh, flex ceramic. Let's see. <laughs> here we go. Mm -hmm. So here I have some actual printing parameters. Remember, you should hit save whenever you change anything. Otherwise, it might not exactly register. That's fine. It's just a, actually take that off. Okay. Just preventing the heater from going on. So now you see the time just went up because it's actually it has something to go off of. And now that it's printing, you might not see it flashing anything because it's UV light. So you're not gonna receive it. But let's say, I mean, now it's actually running something, which is the difference. If you put a piece of like printer paper over the surface, you can see the UV light. So we can try that just as a little test. So like you see, I canceled it, it took a second and then it just goes back up. Um, and it's gonna take a little bit more if you're in the middle of a print and you cancel. So here I'm just holding a piece of paper and ripping it. I'm gonna put it on top of the bed with like no uh, like printer bed or vat, vat inside, like locked in, just so we can like test if the UV light is actually shining. You don't really need to do this, but it's just like a proof for us that it is gonna be flashing the images from, from the part that we're printing. So yeah, that's the image flashing on the paper. You don't want to do this with this uh, like screen up. You want to keep this down so like there isn't UV light shining on your eyes. That would be really bad. But yeah, there you go. So, you, I mean, you could show the thing here. It disappeared, like the, the UV light isn't shining anymore right now because in this part of the print, the bed would be rising and then going back down like allowing for the resin to flow back in and fill up that space and then once it's done doing that it'll shine the image again that might take a couple seconds so we can still see the image flashing on here but i hit cancel a few seconds ago so this is just to show uh when you hit cancel you might not see it stop immediately it's going to try to finish that layer and then cancel so they're finished and now it's actually moving up So the resin separated from the powder. You can kind of see it like settled on the bottom of the of the bottle. So we have to remix it before we use it. That's because it doesn't have a dispersant right now, but yeah. So yeah, the material's mixed now, we blended it. Um, but I just put a little bit in this piece of glassware. You're gonna see in a minute why this is too small and this is a problem, but we're just gonna run a quick test on it so it's no big deal. Uh, normally you should use a wider one, I just don't want to have one in the room right now. But basically you just want to make sure that the bed isn't actually mounted on. Like there's no vat film, it's just straight on there. You don't, like you want to be absolutely certain though before you put one of these in with the material. But like none of it's dripping over the side, you're not going to get any on the screen. Like you want to make sure that glassware is clean because uh, you really don't want to be messing with that screen. That's like what's actually making your part. You don't want to scratch it up. I'm just gonna close it and I'm gonna run up like a, a part and what I'm gonna do for a first layer test just to make sure the material is actually printing is after one layer I'm gonna cancel the print let the whole thing in I'll pour the resin back out like the slurry and I'll just see like did something print. normally if you had a bigger uh, piece of glassware you'd also scoop it out and like get our it's like a micrometer it's like a caliper that measures in micrometers and uh, actually take measurements and know how thick it is. I'm just going to start a 
here, let's just actually use this one. So this is, these might not be the right settings. I'm just gonna see if it does anything. Like, just so you know, like we're printing something and uh, we'll see if it prints like an actual layer. So yeah, if you wanna get that like under it, you can see kind of like the square there. It should be stuck in, it shouldn't be like moving around. But uh, basically after we printed one layer, I just canceled the prints and you can see that it actually made something. Now we're gonna have to clean it up um, and like take it out because this thing is so small, we're probably gonna break it while we take it out. So that was the issue. But um, like at least you know that the new slurry you made is working and you can optimize it. Basically, I'm just pouring it back in. See the cube there? Awesome. Uh, we'll clean this with alcohol. Like you wanna use isopropyl or ethanol. Don't use acetone because you'll break down the resin. I'm like, oh, you probably hear me say that a million times. Don't use acetone. Um, yeah, you can see the cube there. It's going to be a little hard to remove here, but we'll take it out. Once you get like most of the resin off, ideally you could use one of these like rubber spatulas. It's not clean right now, but assuming it was clean and it's a bigger surface, you can kind of use a rubber spatula like this to scrape it. Just gently like... Kind of like imagine you're painting something don't like drive it into the surface just gently okay so actually so you can see the number we got the digital micrometer that's the name of this and took the measurement of that layer brandon cut it off successfully and so you can see it's 852 microns so um we're way over that what that means is we'll probably have to decrease the initial exposure time significantly uh, until we get a good measurement.